Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with my big fat Greek salad. That's right, I did think I was the first one to think of this name. But after a quick search, I realized others had thought of this before me. However, the good news is so many people thought of this that I still get to use it. Or if just one person was using this, I would have had to think of something else. Like Zorba the Greek salad or something like that. But anyway, the surprising part isn't that other people thought of this name. It's that after all these years, I still hadn't done a video for this. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by prepping the star of the show, a couple nice big cucumbers. And if you're using the regular ones, you should probably peel them. But with these English cucumbers, you can actually eat the peel. So I don't have to peel them, but what I am going to do is take this channel knife and actually go around taking off some strips of the skin for no other reason than to give this a little more visual interest. And if you have a zester, take a look. It might actually come with that tool. Okay, a lot of them do. And then once that's set, we'll go ahead and cut these in half. And then we'll cut each of those pieces in half lengthwise. And then eventually into quarters. At which point, as usual, we'll go ahead and turn those this way and cut across into nice equal slices. Somewhere I'd say between a quarter and a half inch. Or I think in a head, I want these sort of the same size as our tomatoes. Okay, I'm not a big fan of Greek salads where every ingredient is like a totally different size. But anyway, we'll go ahead and slice those up. And then we could transfer those into a bowl and start mixing our salad. But I'm actually going to transfer them into a colander. Because I'm going to do one optional step first. The old salt and rinse. Which means I'm going to sprinkle over about a tablespoon of kosher salt. And then give these a quick toss. At which point I'm going to let them sit for about 10 to 15 minutes. Before rinsing the salt off and draining them. And while I did say this step is optional, it's also mandatory. Basically we're drawing out a little bit of the bitterness. And because we're removing a little bit of the water, we're actually going to get a little bit of a denser, crispier texture. So we'll go ahead and let those sit for, like I said, about 10 to 15 minutes, which will be the perfect amount of time to slice up some of our other ingredients. For example, these beautiful toy box tomatoes. And for most of these, I'm just going to simply slice them in half. All right, we might have a couple big ones we can cut in quarters. But generally, by cutting these in half, we're going to get something that's pretty close to the size of our cucumber pieces. And of course, just because I'm using cherry tomatoes doesn't mean you can't just cut up some regular ones. All right, you are after all the Socrates of your tomato varieties. And yes, if you want to show off, you can cut two at once. But either way, we'll go ahead and cut up whatever we're going to use. And once that's set, we'll go back and check our cucumbers, which at this point have been sitting here for about 10 minutes. And as you could hopefully see, in just that short amount of time, that salt has already leached out a couple tablespoons of liquid. And what we'll want to do at this point is go ahead and rinse these thoroughly under cold water. And then once rinsed, we want to let these drain very, very, very thoroughly. Okay, at least another 10 or 15 minutes. And then what we can do while we're waiting for those to drain is go ahead and slice up the rest of our ingredients, which will include some red onion that we want to slice very thinly with a very sharp knife. Okay, it's a proven scientific fact that people that don't like onions probably grew up in households that had really dull knives which will crush the cells of an onion instead of slicing through, which makes them very, very harsh. Okay, so use a nice sharp knife and slice very thinly. And don't be a hero. When that piece gets too small to slice thinly and safely, stop and use that in something else. Okay, chop it up and make a big fat Greek omelet or something. And then besides our onion, we also want to do a little bit of red bell pepper, which as you well know, we usually just cut into strips and then slice across to dice. But this time for something a little extra special. Why don't we turn our knife at like a 45 degree angle and cut something that's more like a diamond shape? All right, as you've heard me say before, people love pointy food. So we'll go ahead and cut some pepper diamonds before moving on to the last major ingredient, our Greek olives. And I have two types here, the purplish black famous Kalamata olives, which we'll simply cut in half. And then some nice big green olives, which I'm not sure where they're from but let's say grease. And because we have the Kalamatas, just for a change of pace, let's go ahead and slice these the other way. And that's it, assuming our cucumbers are now well-drained, we can go ahead and put this salad together, which means adding everything to this nice big bowl so we have plenty of room to toss. At which point we can go ahead and add our herbs and seasonings, including a whole bunch of freshly chopped oregano, which really is the herb you want to go with here. We'll also do some freshly ground black pepper, and a little bit of kosher salt, but be careful. Because the olives are salty, and we already salted our cucumber, and we still have to add some feta later. 
And we'll finish up with a little shake of the cayenne. And then the first of our two ingredients that make up our dressing. And we have to, we must start with the red wine vinegar. Okay, if you only remember one thing from this video, is that you have to sprinkle in your vinegar first, and then toss everything, and then add the oil. Okay, if we add our oil first, it's gonna coat the vegetables and basically waterproof them, and that beautiful red wine vinegar will not penetrate. So what we wanna do, what we must do, is add our vinegar first, and then give this a thorough tossing, and then we can drizzle in our oil. And of course, as usual, I will give the amounts in the blog post. Although I am just gonna guess, because this is totally to taste. And then what we'll do once our oil has been drizzled in, and everything's been mixed, is we'll stop and we'll add about two thirds of our feta cheese, which you can just go ahead and crumble, but I do prefer to dice it. And what I like to do is mix in about two thirds at this point, and then we'll mix this all up and let it sit for a while, and then we'll add that last third right before we serve it. And that way this portion of cheese can sort of start absorbing the flavors of the salad, as well as of course giving up some of that salty flavor to the other ingredients. And then like I said, we'll add the rest later. So we'll go ahead and add the cheese and give it a thorough mixing. And then once that is all combined, we'll go ahead and wrap it with plastic and pop it in the fridge for between 30 minutes and an hour. But that's just me. Some folks say you should serve it immediately, and other folks say it should sit overnight. Okay, so you'll have to decide exactly how long to let this sit. I mean, you are after all the Play-Doh of when to plate, bro. So come at me if you want. But personally, I think it's best if you let it sit for between 30 and 60 minutes. At which point we'll go ahead and pull that out and unwrap it and give it one last final mix. At which point, of course, we're gonna have to taste this for seasoning and check to see if it needs more salt or more vinegar or more oil or whatever. Okay, don't be surprised if you're gonna have to adjust a little. But I'm happy to report mine was perfect. Which means we can go ahead and finish this off adding the rest of the cheese, either by mixing it in now and then serving up, or serving it up and then scattering the rest of the cheese over. Which is my preference. And we'll go ahead and finish that off with one last scattering of freshly chopped oregano. And that's it. Our big fat Greek salad is ready to enjoy. So let me go ahead and grab a spoon and dig in. Oh yeah, spoon's better than a fork for this. And there's no mystery why this is considered one of the world's great salads. Above and beyond being absolutely gorgeous, it has such a perfect combination of textures and tastes. Okay, it's cold, it's crunchy, it's bracing, it's salty, it's sour, it's sweet, it's tangy, it's... Well, I ran out of words. But to summarize, it's absolutely fantastic. Oh, and if you happen to be a fan of gazpacho, once this salad's gone, refrigerate the leftover juices, and you're going to be enjoying one of the greatest cold, unintentional soups ever. But anyway, that's it. What I and like a thousand other people are calling a big fat Greek salad. This is like the perfect thing to bring when you have to go to one of those things where you're supposed to bring something, but you forgot. And you're like, I thought that was next weekend. And your wife's like, no, it's this weekend. Because this is so quick to put together and gorgeous and delicious, it really is the perfect thing to bring. Or of course, just make it for yourself. But either way, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. The Brutus. That's right, watch your back, Caesar because there's a new amazing salad conspiring to replace you as America's favorite. And while that may sound far-fetched, this salad is so delicious, I think there's actually a chance that could happen. I mean, not a good chance, but a chance nonetheless. And since it's been so incredibly hot in San Francisco this week, I thought the timing was perfect to share this recipe I recently stole from a chef in the wine country. And I'll be making a full confession on the blog where that was. But in the meantime, let's go ahead and get started with the dressing. And just by force of habit, I went ahead and made my usual damp towel ring, which, as you may know, will keep the bowl steady as we whisk in the oil. But then I realized this dressing is so simple, we don't even have to do that. Thanks to the first and main ingredient in this dressing, some Dijon mustard. And not just any Dijon. I want you to use the hottest and most intense Dijon you can find. And to check, you could use a smell test. Or if you stick your nose into an open jar and take a deep sniff, it should literally burn your nasal passages. By the way, food wishes and all recipes are not responsible for any burned nasal passages. And then to the mustard, we will also add some vegetable oil, as well as some seasoned rice vinegar, which is simply rice vinegar that has a little salt and sugar in it. And then, mostly because I enjoy trying to pronounce it, let's also do a few dashes of Worcestershire sauce. And then we will finish up by seasoning very simply with some freshly ground black pepper. 
as well as a few enthusiastic shakes of cayenne. And that's going to be it for this very simple and very sharply flavored dressing. And as I mentioned earlier, this is not one of those dressings where we have to slowly drizzle in the oil. Okay, mustard is a natural emulsifier, so all we need to do is whisk this for about a minute, and it should come together beautifully, as this one did here. And then if you do want to give it a taste, go ahead, but it's very difficult to adjust dressings when they're not on the salad. So we'll deal with final adjustments later, but for now we'll go ahead and transfer this into some kind of container, and we'll simply reserve that until needed. And by the way, fair warning if you do taste this, because this may actually taste too sharp, too acidic, too hot, quote unquote, from that Dijon. But as you'll realize when this all comes together, that's going to be very important to play off those sweet and savory ingredients in the salad. So anyway, our dressing's done, and we'll set that aside and move on to the other thing we can prep ahead of time. And that would be our toasted pecans, which I'm going to do in this pan with a little bit of vegetable oil over medium heat. And what we'll do is stir these or toss them around in this pan for about four minutes or so, or until they are just slightly toasted. And you know the drill, we have to sort of use our nose, since nuts are already sort of a toasty color. So not only will we go by time, and maybe what these look like, but when you get the first whiffs of toasted nuts, you know you're getting close. And what we'll do when we've reached that point is season these very simply with a little bit of kosher salt, as well as about a teaspoon or so of white sugar, and we'll toss that around with these freshly toasted pecans, and we'll give that maybe 30 seconds more, and that's it. We'll turn off the heat and transfer those to a plate to cool. And no, I'm not calling these candy pecans because there's not enough sugar on them. Okay, if you do want to candy them, go ahead. But I don't. I want just a very subtle sweetness on the surface. So that's why I'm only doing a little touch of sugar. And then what we'll want to do before we move on to the next step is eat one. There we go. Okay, so our pecans are set, our dressing's done, and other than some lettuce and apples, the other ingredients we're going to need for this insanely delicious salad are some fresh dill, a little bit of fresh tarragon, and a hunk of some extra sharp cheddar cheese, which really is kind of the secret ingredient here. And at this point, we can move on to final assembly, assuming we've decided on a lettuce. All right, the place I stole this from uses little gem, which are beautiful, but not always easy to find. So here I'm going with some hearts of romaine, which I've sliced into bite-sized pieces. And then besides some washed and thoroughly dried lettuce, we're also going to want to toss in a whole bunch of freshly sliced apple. And I'm going to be using both red and green apples. I had one Fuji and one Granny Smith. But feel free to use any variety you like. You are, after all, the Brutus of your Frutus. I think I'm also supposed to make some kind of et tu reference, but I'm unsure of the context. So we will simply continue assembling by adding our fresh dill and tarragon, which we'll sort of roughly chop, and not too fine. We actually want to see and feel pieces of that herb. We can also go ahead and throw in a nice big handful of our lightly seasoned, slightly sweetened, but not candied pecans. And then what we'll do before we toss all this with our dressing is grate in our cheddar, but very lightly. And what I mean by that is don't apply a lot of pressure as you're grating. And by using a light touch, we're going to get some nice small shreds of cheese. Okay, it's a proven scientific fact that the harder you press, the longer the shredded cheese is going to be. Which is not exactly going to wreck the salad, but these smaller shavings are going to mix in a lot better, I think. So we'll go ahead and grate in our cheddar, using a lot more finesse than one would think. And then last but not least, we will pour in whatever we think is an appropriate amount of dressing, and we will give that a toss until perfectly coated. And normally I would use my bare hands, if my guests weren't watching. But here I decided to go very civilized, and use this very specialized salad tossing fork and spoon set. And please keep in mind, whenever you're saucing a salad, you can always add, but you can't delete. So I'm generally careful with the initial tossing, and then I'll give it a taste and evaluate. And not just if it needs more dressing, but also does it need more salt, or acidity, or whatever. But I'm very happy to report mine was perfect. So I transferred it into this wooden salad bowl. Although I'm not exactly sure if something rectangular can be called a bowl. I'm sure some people online will let me know. And then of course I will regret having asked. So I went ahead and transferred that in, and then spent about 15 minutes separating those apple slices, and redistributing them where I thought they looked good. And then if we want for a finishing touch, we can grate a little more cheddar over the top, and maybe add a few more pecans. Although I do recommend you don't worry about their placement as much as I am. They almost always look better if you just scatter them over versus placing them. But anyway, I did add a little more stuff to the top. And that's it. This amazing salad that I'm calling the Brutus is done. And it's really hard to sound super excited about a salad without sounding crazy. 
But when I first had this incredible combination of taste and textures, I really was blown away. I mean, the way that super sharp, intensely mustardy dressing pairs with that bittersweet lettuce and very sweet apples is just an incredible combination. Not to mention the crunch and nuttiness of the pecans, all brought together beautifully by that sort of savory saltiness of the cheddar. So I'm just absolutely thrilled I found this salad and that I'm able to share it with you. Oh, and you're probably way ahead of me, but this thing is like a grilled pork chop or grilled chicken breast away from being like the perfect summer dinner. But having said that, just enjoy it as is like this. It is incredibly satisfying and borderline decadent. But anyway, that's it, what I'm calling the Brutus salad. I believe it was Julius Caesar who once said, it is better to create than learn. And while I really don't fully understand what that means, it would make a very cool t-shirt. But anyway, now that you've learned how to make this salad, I really do hope you create one soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Egg roll in a bowl. That's right, you might think this was invented to avoid all that time-consuming wrapping and messy deep frying, but it wasn't. It was invented by the keto people because they can't eat egg roll wrappers. But you know who can eat egg roll wrappers? This guy. So instead of what's really egg roll filling in a bowl, we are going to do the real thing in all its tasty and textural glory. And to get started, let's go ahead and prep what makes this version so vastly superior. And that would be some crispy fried wonton strips. Except we're not going to fry them, we're going to bake them. Which is way, way easier and less messy. And what we'll do is cut up about 3-4 to four wonton wrappers per person into approximately quarter inch strips. And once that's been accomplished, we'll go ahead and transfer that onto a pan. And then we'll drizzle over a little bit of vegetable oil and toss them until they're all coated. And then finally, we will spread those out so they bake nice and evenly. And yes, of course you can deep fry these to make them crispy, which would be a lot faster, but also a lot messier. And if we're doing something called egg roll in a bowl to avoid the messy frying, then deep frying these strips does not make a lot of sense. And that's it once we have those thoughtfully spread out. We will simply pop those into the center of a 350 degree oven for about 12 minutes or so, or until they are beautifully browned. And believe it or not, that's all there is to this. As soon as those cool down, they're gonna become beautifully crispy. And we will simply set those aside and use them later to top our bowl. And that's it, once that's set, we can move on to our vegetable prep. And today I'll be using some green cabbage and carrot, which are the most common vegetables used in egg roll filling. And I'm just going to use half of this little Savoy cabbage. And after cutting that in half, we will quarter it. At which point it's going to be very easy to trim off that core on the bottom. And while you can buy one of those pre-cut coleslaw mixes, I really hope you don't. Because by the time you get one of those, they're like three or four days old. And as I hope you can see here, it really is pretty fast and easy to do. And why this is so simple is because, as you may know, a head of cabbage is made up of many, many layers of leaves. And when you slice those thinly across like this, after just a minute or two of slicing, you're going to have a big old pile of beautifully shredded cabbage. And because we're using a knife sharp knife, and not a giant dull vegetable chopper like at the store, ours is going to taste sweet and fresh, as opposed to theirs, which tastes old and bitter. And nobody, and I mean nobody, likes old and bitter. And that's it, once we have that sliced up, we can transfer that into a bowl, and we will move on to prepping our carrot, which I like to do with one of these Japanese-style mandolins which makes beautiful uniform matchsticks. And by the way, leave one end on the table. I pick mine up so you can see the pieces falling down, which added absolutely nothing to the presentation. But anyway, the point is that's a fast and easy way to do this. But if you don't have one, don't worry, because I know you have a potato peeler. And you can simply prep your carrots by making nice peels like this. And that will work just about the same. So to summarize, there's no reason to buy the pre-made cabbage and carrot slaw mix. Since start to finish, that's only going to take you about five minutes. And then besides our two main ingredients, I also decided to do a little bit of julienne red pepper, mostly because I had some in the fridge. We can also, if we want, do some freshly sliced green onions, as well as some minced garlic, plus pretty much any other veggies we find in the fridge we want to use up. And that's it. The last thing we should prep before we head to the stove would be our very simple sauce, which we'll start with some soy. And then to that, we will add some rice vinegar, as well as, if you have it, some sake wine, or Chinese rice wine, or if times are tough, just a little bit of regular white wine. 
Or if times are really, really tough, nothing. Okay, that's optional. We'll also add a little touch of sesame oil, as well as a little bit of white sugar, followed by some freshly and very finely grated ginger. And of course, a little bit of cayenne never hurts, especially when combined with a little touch of white pepper. And if you don't have that, use some freshly ground black. But if you have some, the white pepper is really nice here. And then we will finish up with a little touch of ketchup, as well as the secret ingredient here, about a half a teaspoon of cornstarch. And that's it. We'll simply give that a stir until that's all dissolved. And what that little bit of cornstarch is going to do later, when we mix this into our meat and vegetables, is that it's going to tighten up and thicken those juices just a bit. And any and all of our accumulated juices are going to become more of a glaze. And that's it. Once that's been mixed up, we can head to the stove where we will transfer a half pound of ground pork and do a skillet set over medium high heat. And then what we'll do is go ahead and break this up and crumble it as it browns. And no, we don't need to add any oil if we're going to use pork, since it's going to have plenty of fat, which is one of the reasons that's my choice here. But having said that, pretty much any ground meat's going to work here. Okay, turkey, chicken, beef being obvious alternative choices. So use what you want. I mean, you are after all the Billy Joel of your egg roll in a bowl. And speaking of New York state of mind, the next time I have some leftover pastrami, I am going to use it for this. Unfortunately, leftover pastrami is not really a thing. And then once I had that broken up pretty well with the wooden spatula, I switched to something a little more flexible and spoony. But anyway, no matter what meat you use, we want to make sure we break it up nice and small and cook it until we get a little bit of brown crustification on the surface. All right, you see that? That is going to taste better than non-brown meat. Oh, and if you do happen to use one of those leaner choices, You'll probably have to add a little bit of oil to the pan so this happens. But that's fine. That is just you cooking. And then once we're happy with how our meat looks, we'll go ahead and dump in our vegetable mixture, and we will take our tongs and carefully mix that in. And then, very important, we are only going to cook this for like one or two minutes, or until those vegetables just start to soften and become flexible. All right? We don't want to cook these vegetables all the way through at this point or any point. So we're going to cook those very briefly, or until they look a little something like this. At which point we can stir in our sauce. And by the time that's been mixed in, and our vegetables have cooked maybe one more minute, everything should be ready. Which means we can pull it off the heat and transfer it into a bowl. And in case you're keeping score at home, the amounts seen in this video are going to make two portions. And then once we have our egg roll filling bowl, we will top that with our crispy wonton strips. Plus if you want a few more sliced green onions which I think look nice, especially for the contractually obligated pictures. And that's it, our actual egg roll in a bowl is now ready to enjoy. And if you're wondering if those few crispy wonton chips on top really make that big of a difference, well, yes, they do. I mean, don't get me wrong, the filling's amazing, but this is not going to taste or feel like an egg roll without that crispy, crunchy wonton wrapper. And by the way, is a few grams of carbs really a deal breaker? Come on. I mean, you look fine. But anyway, suit yourself. And I don't believe egg rolls have ever been considered a health food. But presented in this format, what we're eating here is basically a big old bowl of vegetables, seasoned with a little bit of meat. All right, there's only four ounces of pork in this whole bowl. So it really is mostly vegetables, and very similar to the ratio you get in an actual egg roll. And of course, in a restaurant that's done because the vegetable filler is much cheaper, and it's a lot better for the chef's food costs. All right, those Chinese Zodiac placemats don't pay for themselves. But regardless of the reason, this ratio really works. And as far as the flavor goes, this stuff tastes exactly, exactly like a really, really good egg roll. And yet we've avoided all that time-consuming rolling them up and that smelly, messy deep frying, which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Smash cucumber salad. That's right, out of all the various culinary techniques, I would say smashing is probably the easiest to learn and most fun. And by utilizing this very primitive technique, we're not only gonna relieve a little bit of stress, we're also gonna transform the always boring cucumber into something that's actually exciting. And I know that is hard to believe, but it's true, as you will hopefully find out. So with that, let's go ahead and get started by prepping our cucumbers. And by prepping, we mean smashing. And the variety I'll be forcibly flattening today is the English cucumber, 
which is my favorite choice for this since the skin is very thin and tender and not too bitter. But having said that, any variety of cucumber you like to eat will work here. And what we'll do before we start smashing is cover this with a piece of plastic so as to hopefully minimize potential splattering. And then once that cucumber is covered, all we need to do is smash it flat using any kind of flat heavy object. Like for example this meat pounder. Okay, other popular choices would be the flat of a cleaver, or even a small pot or pan. It really doesn't matter as long as our cucumber gets smashed as shown. So you decide. You are after all the Gallagher, of which smashing tool you prefer. And then what we'll do once our cucumber's been successfully smashed flat, is unwrap it and cut it up into smaller pieces. Which I'm gonna make, I don't know, about an inch to an inch and a half wide. And of course you know the drill. The exact size doesn't really matter, as long as you pick a size and stick with it. And in case you're wondering, the reason we smash the cucumbers is threefold. Okay, we're doing it for appearance and texture, but most importantly, we're doing it for flavor. Since believe it or not, if we smash our cucumber before we cut it, it will actually have a different and what many people consider a better flavor than if we didn't. Okay, a good analogy would be how we prep our garlic for aioli, where instead of slicing or chopping, we actually crush the garlic, which ends up bringing out a lot more flavor. So while not exactly the same, that's sort of what's going on here. But anyway, I went ahead and smashed and cut up two English cucumbers, at which point we're going to want to transfer those into some kind of strainer set over a bowl. Because the next step, while not as fun as smashing, is almost as important. And what that entails is sprinkling over some sugar and salt over our cucumbers. And then taking a spatula and mixing that very well. And then what we're going to do once these three ingredients are combined is set that in the fridge for anywhere between 30 and 60 minutes. And during that time, the sugar and salt's going to draw liquid out of the cucumbers which will drain into the bowl below. And that's gonna accomplish two things that I will cover later when we pull this out of the fridge. So for now, let's just go ahead and transfer that into the fridge for, like I said, between 30 and 60 minutes. And while we're waiting, we can go ahead and mix up our dressing. And no, to answer your question, I do not get free beer sent to me because I show it in my fridge. Not that I wouldn't. I'm looking at you, every beer company in America. But anyway, we'll pop that in the fridge and move on to the dressing. And we'll start with some crushed garlic in a mixing bowl. And then to that, we will add some rice vinegar, as well as a little bit of soy sauce. And then we'll finish up with the last two ingredients, which are a little touch of sesame oil. And that is a key ingredient here, so don't skip that. And then let's finish up with some chili flakes. And my favorite variety to use for this is Korean chili flakes, since there's no seeds. Plus, they're not too spicy, which is why I'm not adding any cayenne. Okay, don't forget, we're making this a serve next to hot, smoky, maybe spicy meats. So not only do we want that contrast in temperature, but we also don't want the spice level fighting with whatever we pair this with. But regardless, no matter what chili you decide to use, all we need to do is give this a quick whisk, and that's it. It is ready to dress our cucumbers with. Speaking of which, let's go ahead and pull those out of the fridge and see what they look like about 30 minutes later. And as predicted, that salt and sugar has drawn a lot of liquid out of the cucumbers, which not only is gonna improve the texture and concentrate the flavor, but also apparently a lot of the stuff that makes a cucumber bitter is in that liquid. So mission accomplished. And we can now go ahead and transfer our drained cucumbers into our dressing. And we will go ahead and give that a mix. And theoretically, as soon as this is all combined and we've tasted and adjusted for seasoning, we can, if we want, go ahead and serve this immediately. Which according to many smashed cucumber salad aficionados is the best way to go. However, other cucumber smashers such as myself think it's better to leave this in the fridge for about 30 minutes so that our cucumbers have enough time to mingle with the dressing. So that's what I do. After mixing and tasting for seasoning, I'll go ahead and wrap that up and pop it in the fridge for about 30 minutes and maybe even give it a toss while it sits. And I'll probably touch on that in the blog post. I mean, I gotta write about something. But either way, whether you let this sit in the fridge for a little while or serve it immediately, we will go ahead and transfer that into some kind of serving container. And then one optional step, I like to grab a spoon and spend about 15 minutes moving around individual pieces of cucumber so that they look perfect for the pictures. And then once that's said, I do like to spoon over a little extra dressing, although a lot of the experts say to serve it drained. I always like to have a little something at the bottom to dip in. And then last but not least, we will finish up with some toasted sesame seeds. And that's it, our smashed cucumber salad is ready to enjoy, which is probably best done with a fork. But I decided to go ahead and impress you with my chopstick game, which is pretty strong. Don't let the fact that I stabbed that first one throw you off. But regardless, no matter how you decide to get this up to your face, you are gonna be very glad you did. Okay, obviously this is cold, 
And thanks to the salt and sugar in the draining time, nice and crisp. But above and beyond the temperature and texture, the flavors here are so bright and fresh and vibrant and addictive. It's actually hard to eat slow. Unless, of course, you're using chopsticks. But anyway, the point is, this is shockingly delicious. And all thanks to a little bit of smashing. Of course, having said that, only a crazy person is going to sit and eat a whole bowl of cucumber salad by itself. So once this video ends, I want you to start brainstorming exactly what you're going to serve this with. And I'll give you one idea to get you started. And that would be some beautiful, sticky, smoky, barbecued baby back ribs. So that really was an amazing pairing, as are so many other things that are going to come off your grill this summer. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Panzanella salad. That's right, there are hundreds of ways you can make this very simple, very rustic tomato and bread salad, but I don't want you to use any of those. Because while delicious, the one thing they all have in common, they're all also very soggy. So we're going to do things a little differently, and by using some proprietary fried bread cube technology, we're going to get something that's not only tasty, but far, far superior texturally. So let me show you how to do this, and we'll get started with the second most important ingredient, the bread. And for this, you're going to need some stale bread, two to three day old bread. Fresh bread is just not going to work as well for this. So this is the perfect thing to do when you have half a loaf of bread left over, which is exactly what I have. And all we need to do is cube this up, so I'm going to cut a couple half inch slices, kind of cut those into strips, and then we'll turn it and just cut across that way into some nice, fairly evenly sized pieces. And you know the standing rule. Nobody cares how big you make your cube, but when you do pick a size, stick with it. So these cook evenly. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and cube up half a loaf of bread, crust and all. And once our bread is prepped, what we're going to do is we're going to transfer that into a large skillet, and we're going to place that over medium heat, and we're going to toast this bread in the pan with lots of olive oil. I mean a lot. Make sure there's some on every cube. And then what we'll do is we'll go ahead and toast those bread cubes over medium heat until they just start to turn golden. And that's gonna take you a few minutes. And I used the term toast earlier. What I really should be saying is fry these, okay? We really wanna fry the surface of the bread cube. We don't just wanna toast it all the way through. All right, I want something crunchy on the outside, but that still has a little bit of chewiness inside. And at any point you think it needs a little more olive oil, add some. See right here I noticed a few pieces that looked a little dry. So I gave it another little drizzle. So I'm gonna keep those moving. You can use a spatula to stir, or you can use the old flippa flippa, if you know how to do it. And if you don't, check out our video. I showed you how to do that using cheese balls. Oh yeah, that's not a joke. So I'm gonna keep those moving till, like I said, they start to turn golden brown. And at that point, we're gonna stop, and we're gonna grate over some fresh Parmigiano Reggiano, and we're gonna finely grate that all over the surface. And what's gonna happen here, thanks to all that olive oil and this Parmesan, these bread cubes are going to get crunchy and crispy, and even when they get soaked with that dressing later, they're still going to retain some crunchiness, which I think is the key to this technique, okay? So keep that going over medium heat, stirring and or tossing, until you have something that's beautifully golden brown. Or it should look something like this. The outside should be hard and crispy, but still a little bit of chewiness on the inside. All right, if you press these cubes with a spatula and they just shatter into crumbs, that's too much. And I don't have time to explain now, but if you're thinking this would be way faster and easier in the oven, it would be, but it's not gonna be as good. And I'll explain that on the blog. And when we're happy with those, we're gonna turn off the heat and let those cool completely. All right, you definitely don't wanna mix a salad with these warm. And if for any reason, one of those bread cubes doesn't look quite right to you, just eat it. All right, in the business, we call that destroying the evidence. So our crispy olive oil soaked, Parmesan crisped bread cubes are ready. And it's time to move on to the most important ingredient, the tomatoes. As you can see here, I have a colorful colander full of what we call toy box tomatoes, which just means a variety of different colors and shapes. And of course, these have been washed thoroughly. And all we're going to do to prep these is cut them in half. And one quick point here, I want you to cut them all in half no matter how small they are. Whole cherry tomatoes in a panzanella salad do not work. All right, there's an old saying, whole tomatoes don't bleed. Okay, sounds much better in Italian. But what it means is if you don't cut these tomatoes open, we're not going to get those amazing juices flowing out which is really the key to the dressing. So we'll go ahead and we'll cut all those in half. And yes, I've seen the trick with the plate where you cut them all at once. It doesn't work if you have different sized tomatoes like I do. But if you want, you can cut a few at a time. And once those are cut, we'll go ahead and toss those in a bowl and season them up. So we're gonna need some salt, a little bit of freshly ground black pepper, and a pinch of sugar. All right, don't use it if it's contrary to your culinary belief system, but it really is important here. 
The sugar along with the salt is really what draws the liquid out of those tomatoes, which as I just mentioned is key. We're also gonna need some kind of acid. And for me, there's only one choice, red wine vinegar. In my opinion, that's what works the best in this by far. All right, I think balsamic's way too sweet, but suit yourself. And then we're also gonna drizzle in some extra virgin olive oil, the best stuff you got. And I'm gonna give that a little mix. And then the only other thing I'm gonna put in here is a little bit of finely minced garlic. And you'll see in lots of other recipes, they're calling for cucumbers and peppers and onions and lots of other stuff. I don't think any of that should go in here. And really the only way I can explain my reasons for not doing that is if you taste this, because I think you'll agree, there's no way it could have gotten any better. But anyway, we're gonna stir in some garlic. And you can see already here, we got lots of those juices forming. Ooh, that's looking good. And then all we're gonna do is cover that and let that sit for about 20 minutes. And in just that short amount of time, you're gonna be amazed at how much juice comes out. And while we are waiting for that magic to happen, let's go ahead and prep the last ingredient, some fresh basil. Just grab four or five big leaves, kind of roll them up like that. And then take your sharpest knife and just slice it across like this into thin ribbons. Our French friends would call that chiffonade. All right, so our basil set, let's go ahead and check our tomatoes. It's been about 20 minutes. And as you can see, very, very juicy. And we are ready for final assembly. So let's go ahead and toss in our basil. I'm also gonna give it another little additional splash of oil and vinegar. And you may have to adjust that as you go. So let's go ahead and give that a quick mix. And then last but not least, we're gonna put in roughly equal amounts of our fried bread cubes. And I certainly don't want you to measure those. Just dump a couple handfuls in. In fact, that reminds me, I don't think I'm gonna give any ingredient amounts here. It's really not that kind of a recipe. Seriously, one of the only ways to screw up a recipe like this is overthink it. So we'll toss our bread in, and then we're gonna mix that up for a good two or three minutes until you're fairly certain all those bread cubes are fully saturated. And then what I like to do is kind of pat it down a little bit and just let it sit there for three or four minutes. Because here's how you're gonna tell if you have enough dressing. After you toss that, if you come back three or four minutes later and it's all been absorbed, you need more. Put in a little more vinegar, a little more olive oil, give it another toss. So you'll have to check that, you'll have to adjust. You are the Confucius of your panzanella juices. And above and beyond that, you're also obviously checking for salt. And once we're happy with how it looks and tastes, we'll go ahead and plate that up. I'm gonna garnish with a little more freshly chiffonaded basil. And I'll also do one more last drizzle of extra virgin olive oil to kind of shine up the top. And that gorgeous, but fairly untraditional panzanella salad is done. And while we have the same amazing flavors that you get in the more authentic versions, we don't have that same soupy, soggy bread. Which reminds me, panzanella actually means little swamp. And while it may make me a bad Italian, I just don't like my panzanella salads too swampy. So the beauty of this technique is even though these cubes are completely saturated, completely soaked with that incredible dressing, they still have some crunch to them. I know it sounds impossible, but it's not. In fact, here's me eating some out of a different bowl, and this was like 10 minutes later, and you can actually hear, even though they're totally soaked, they're still crispy. Just an unbelievable and truly unique sensation. And above and beyond the texture, which is amazing, the flavors here are just indescribable. So whether you've never had this salad before, or you've only had it in its traditional swampy form, I really hope you give this technique a try. If you do, I think you're gonna be a huge fanzanella of the panzanella. All right, so head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Blue cheese walnut chicory salad. That's right, we actually filmed a salad recipe, which is a pretty rare occurrence since who the heck goes online to watch salad videos? But we do make the occasional exception for some of the world's greatest salads that I think everybody should know how to do. And this absolutely gorgeous specimen is one of those. And to get started, the first thing we're gonna do is toast some chopped walnuts, which as usual, we'll do in a dry pan over medium heat. And all we have to do here is stir these around or toss them until they become very hot to the touch and they smell and taste like toasted walnuts. And by the way, I'm doing this wrong. Don't pick the pan up, leave it flat on the stove, and just use a horizontal push and pull method to get these to flip. And by the way, we have a video featuring cheese balls where I teach you how to do this. So check that out if you want. And like I said, we'll toast these over medium heat until they're very hot to the touch, as in you almost burn your fingers grabbing one. And as soon as those are smelling, feeling, and tasting just right, we'll go ahead and turn off the heat because these nuts are done. And then once those are set, we can move on to our vinaigrette which is gonna be a fairly sweet version of a mustard vinaigrette. And that's why our first ingredient is gonna be a couple tablespoons of Dijon. And usually at this point, I would tell you to use any mustard you want, but don't, please use Dijon here. And then to that, we're gonna add a couple relatively sweet vinegars. 
Okay, the first being a seasoned rice vinegar, and the second being a white balsamic, or if you want the much more common regular balsamic. Okay, they'll both work the same, and the only real difference is your dressing will just be a little darker. And then to that, we will also want to add a nice big pinch of freshly ground black pepper. And then what we'll do is go ahead and give this a quick mix before we introduce our olive oil. And by the way, regarding using multiple kinds of vinegars in the same dressing, I wish people would do that more often. Okay, if you look at pretty much any salad dressing recipe, it usually only calls for one kind of vinegar. But just like bartenders will use different kinds of liquors to make a more interesting drink, I think we should do the same thing when we're making salad dressings. Just don't call us mixologists. And please, no suspenders and bow ties. And if you got that joke, you spend way too much time in bars. But anyway, what we'll do once that's mixed up is go ahead and drizzle in our olive oil while whisking constantly. And if you start off slow, just like a teaspoon at a time, until you can see it starting to thicken and emulsify, then we can start adding it a little faster. And the great thing about a mustard vinaigrette is that there's something in the mustard, which I believe is lecithin, that actually helps stabilize the emulsion and will keep the oil and vinegar from separating. And if everything goes according to plan, when you're done, you should have a beautifully thick mixture that will coat the back of a spoon, and it will hold a very, very sharp edge when you drag your finger across it. So that was looking just about perfect. And of course, we'll also give that a taste and adjust it if need be. Okay, the secret to a great dressing for bitter greens is that it's very sharp and acidic, but also a little bit on the sweet side, which is why we did not add too much oil relative to the vinegar, and also we chose vinegars that are on the sweet side. And then once our dressing is set, we can move on to our chicory, or chicories in this case, as we'll be using two of the most common varieties found in the store, some radicchio and some Belgian endive. And we'll go ahead and start with this beautiful head of radicchio, which to prep we will simply cut in half. And then carefully but confidently using two angled cuts, we will cut out the core. And yes, I totally blocked that shot with my hand. So let's see that again. And I blocked that one too. But anyway, once that core is no more, we'll go ahead and cut these halves in half, and then simply turn them and slice across into about one inch pieces. And by the way, I don't recommend snacking on this stuff as you cut it. Okay, this stuff is bitter, and to many people's taste borderline inedible. But once dressed with the nuts and the cheese, an absolutely magical transformation happens, and it turns into one of the best things you've ever tasted. And then what we'll do for our Belgian endive is go ahead and slice a little bit off that root end, which is gonna allow us to peel off some of these leaves or spears as they're called. And when you get to the point where those are not coming off easily, you can always slice a little more off the bottom. Although I should have saved that piece and chopped it up, since really that first slice is the only one you should really discard. But anyway, what we're doing here is we're gonna keep some of these leaves whole for presentation purposes. And then the inside part of the head, will go ahead and slice across like this. And by the way, this ratio is gonna be up to you. Okay, we can leave all of that whole or we can chop everything up. And I generally do about half and half, but that's gonna be up to you. I mean, you are after all the Brittany of your spears. Whoops, I did it again. I think I already used that one in an asparagus video. But anyway, the point is we'll leave some hole and chop the rest up. At which point we'll transfer everything into a nice big bowl. And we'll give that a little pre-tossing to make sure all those leaves are nicely separated and evenly distributed. And also practice a little bit for the main tossing. And once that's set, we'll go ahead and crumble in about half our nuts. And then we'll save the rest for the top. And then we'll do the exact same thing with whatever blue cheese we're gonna use. So I went ahead and crumbled in about half of what was a very beautiful local blue cheese from Sonoma, which I would probably compare to like a Stilton. Although this salad's gonna work with whatever blue cheese you like. But having said that, something that's maybe on a little bit of the richer, sweeter side is ideal which I think generally would be blue cheeses made from cow's milk as opposed to sheep. But anyway, talk to your friendly local cheesemonger. And that's it, we'll go ahead and add as much dressing as we think this needs, which by the way is a lot. Okay, make sure this is generously dressed. And then we'll take a couple clean hands and we'll get in there and get in there deep. And we'll toss this and keep tossing it until everything is perfectly coated. And you know those fancy salad tongs you got as a gift that one time? Don't use those. All right, that's okay to serve this with. All right, to properly toss a salad, fingers and hands are the best. And that's it, once our salad has been tossed, we can transfer that onto some kind of serving platter. And if you wanna be a little bit extra fancy, we can go ahead and place the whole spears around like this. And then once those have been placed down, we can go ahead and pile the rest of the salad on top. At which point, any of the nuts and cheese we didn't mix in can get scattered over the top to create what I think is just a visually stunning 
Borderline Decadent Salad Presentation. Oh, and in case you're wondering, this is like four portions, I would say. Even though Michelle and I will have no problem finishing this. And I didn't this time. But if you did also want to add some nice, sweet, crisp apple slices, that would be good. Or pear, that would also work. But here I was just going for the pure chicory experience. And that, my friends, even if you don't think you like bitter greens, is a shockingly delicious thing to eat. So I'm going to go ahead and grab one of these spears and start eating this nacho style. And if you did make the mistake of trying some of the chicory plain and thought to yourself, why are we eating something that tastes like this? Now that it's dressed with that sweet, tangy mustard vinaigrette and mixed with those crunchy toasted nuts and that wonderfully rich, subtly salty cheese, it's all going to make perfect sense. And you may actually experience when you eat this, what we call in the business, an epiphany. Okay, when you eat a food that has a bitter profile, it really amplifies the sweet, salty, and sour aspects in the other ingredients. And not only does the bitterness of the chicories enhance the other flavors, it also actually stimulates your appetite. And it just makes you want to eat more and more. All right, this is why your more clever chefs generally will start off a menu with an appetizer that has a little bit of bitterness to it. But anyway, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds as I get too deep into these weeds. And I'll just finish up by saying this is one of the world's great salads. And if you've been looking at Radicchio and Belgian endive in the store for years and years, but never bought any because you just didn't think you'd like it, well, I'm here to tell you, you probably do, especially in a salad like this, which is why I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy.